Great. Let me begin today. Welcome you all here. I'm Nancy Tawana, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the Science and Values in Climate Risk Management Lecture Series. This is a series that's sponsored by the Rock Ethics Institute and our Center for Climate Risk Management and was organized by a number of people, but a big shout out to Casey Helgeson, who did most of the work for this. Um, just to let you know how we'll proceed today, um, after I introduce Professor Elliott, um, he will speak for about 40 minutes and then we'll open it up for question and answer. Since we're in a webinar format, if you want to ask a question, there are two ways to do that. One is to type your question into the chat and I will call your question to his attention. Or if you use the raise hand function um, during the question and answer period, I can uh, unmute you when it's your turn and you can ask your question directly of Professor Elliott. So let me do a brief introduction of Professor Elliott. I'm delighted to be able to introduce him. Um, our paths have crossed many times over a longer period of time than even I want to acknowledge. Um, he's a leading figure in philosophy of science and does tremendous research and writing on the area of the influences of ethical and social values on scientific research and how to manage those influences responsibly. I think one wonderful indication of the interdisciplinary nature of his research is his appointment. Um, he is a professor of philosophy at Michigan State University with joint appointments in the Lyman Briggs College, the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife, and the Department of Philosophy. So you can see the way that his work bridges a lot of disciplines. And I was interested to see that he recently uh, led an NSF grant that aimed to examine how team diversity affects scientists' ethical behavior. So although we can't clap away and welcome him, um, you are very welcome, Kevin. Thank you so much for that introduction. I really appreciate it. And I should say that I've regarded uh, Nancy as a, a, a role model over the years in um, thinking about how to be a good philosopher of science and uh, doing interdisciplinary work and uh, just generally being a really uh, uh, a great person in the field to, to work with and provide mentoring for others. So it's really a treat to be able to uh, um, be part of this and present. And I've also really, um, uh, been impressed by the work that Nancy did early on with the Rock Ethics uh, Institute and uh, the work the Institute has continued to do to sort of bridge the sciences with the humanities and the social sciences. So it's a real treat to be able to uh, speak to all of you. Um, I assume you're able to see my slides okay. You let me know if anything's weird. Okay, great. Um, so what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the issue of transparency in science. And this is something I've been thinking about a bit over the past few years. And so I'd like to share some of my reflections with you. And so um, I'd like to start by just highlighting why I think it's important for us to be thinking about transparency in scientific practice. And you know, as Nancy mentioned, I'm really interested in the roles of ethical and social values in science. And I think transparency is really important for addressing these roles of values in science appropriately. Um, but uh, I think that there's a challenge I'd like to discuss in the second part of the talk, which is that you know, transparency I think is more complicated than it might initially seem. It's not as simple as just, you know, being open about the choices one's making in one's research. So after I highlight that, then the third part of the talk, I wanna sort of zero in on a couple of specific issues um, for us to think about. And one is um, how we direct our efforts at transparency to an array of different audiences. And then the second, which I'll elaborate a little bit more later, but um, I think that there are actually interesting value-laden judgments that go into how we are transparent. And so you can actually, I'm saying you can kind of recapitulate the values that might affect your science in affecting how you're transparent. And so um, I'll talk a little bit about that. So let me jump into the first part of the talk. You know, why should we be caring about transparency in science? And um, 
I think it sort of starts with this kind of intuition we tend to have that it's best to keep the roles of scientists and the roles of decision makers um, somewhat distinct. So, you know, we expect decision makers, policy makers to be making difficult ethical and social value judgments. You know, when we face say risks in society, you know, we think, yeah, these policy makers have to decide, you know, given a particular level of risk, you know, how much money are we willing to spend to address it? You know, which kinds of risks to prioritize, how to deal with these um, difficult situations. We don't usually expect the scientists so much to be playing that role. You know, ideally we kind of have this vision that maybe they can provide the information that we can all agree on about the risks we're facing. And then the policymakers can make these tricky decisions about what we do with them. Um, and so I think the worry is if scientists started importing their own ethical and social values into their work, well, then that could threaten the ability of decision makers to sort of make value-laden choices for themselves. It might threaten their self-determination because the scientists are importing their own values that might differ from those of the decision makers. And so just to make this a little bit more concrete, um, an example that I'm gonna be coming back to a few times throughout the talk is um, the idea of say you have a municipality, a city that um, you know, gets its drinking water from a particular lake and they're concerned about the impacts that climate change may have on this um, uh, lake in the future. And they're wondering if they're still going to be able to, to get enough water or if they're going to have to change their, um, uh, their systems. And um, so the, the thought is, you know, suppose that you've got some scientists who really aren't very risk averse. Um, uh, they figure it's best not to spend too much money in response to problems that might not arise. We might think it's kind of worrisome if the scientists um, in advising the decision makers are kind of downplaying the risks. Maybe they're sort of framing the information in ways that really makes it not very uh, seem significant, that that might challenge the ability of these policymakers to make decisions that accord with their own values. So, um, this, you know, seems reasonable at first glance, but a lot of my work has been exploring how this ends up getting more complicated. And I think, you know, I attended um, Professor Lusk's talk that he gave toward the end of last semester, and I think he introduced some of these similar issues that we face. Um, this is something that I've talked about in a book uh, that came out back in 2017, where I was kind of trying to introduce the roles that values play in science. And so the point I make there is that scientists have to make a lot of judgments, especially when doing complicated policy relevant science, that aren't settled by the evidence. So they have to make decisions about, you know, the, which models to use and, you know, how to set up these models. And they have to decide, you know, uh, how to collect their data and which data to rely on, which aren't so reliable. They have to decide how to analyze the data. They have to decide how to interpret different bodies of evidence that they have. Um, they have to decide how much evidence to demand before they're willing to draw conclusions. And then they have to kind of frame this information in various ways to communicate. And so the point is that all these choices or what I'm calling judgments um, can be value laden in various ways. You know, one way that they could be value laden is that the scientists are actually sort of influenced by values, either consciously or subconsciously and making them in ways that support particular values. But it could also be, even if they're not um, sort of influenced by particular values, the choices they make may support particular values over others. So on the next slide, I'm going to be giving an example where, you know, they might make these judgments in ways that are somewhat more precautionary or less primary. And so um, I'll go ahead and, and move on to point out sort of the significance of these uh, value laden judgments. So I think the significance is that the distinction that I kind of initially laid out between the scientists and the decision makers can get blurred because the scientists are having to make these value laden judgments. And so to get back to our example of the, the policymakers who are trying to make decisions about you know, their future water supply, um, I chose this example because it comes from a paper I really like by um, uh, Wendy Parker and Greg Lusk. And um, it's kind of fun, the continuity in this uh, speaker series. You got to hear from Professor Lusk last semester. You get to hear from Professor Parker in a few weeks. So you, know, you get a nice connection here across these talks. But um, they give this example in their paper 
of these um, you know, policymakers predicting future lake water levels. And they point out that in doing this, um, the scientists have to project, say, the amounts of rainfall that um, we may get in the future as a result of uh, climate change. They have to set up hydrological models for how water is going to flow over land into the lake. They have to you know, combine information from multiple climate models as part of their forecasting of what's going to happen. Um, they have to create uncertainty estimates. And so all of these are the kinds of judgments that I, I mentioned that you know, I talk about in my book. And the key point that Parker and Lusk make is um, just to, to make this as simple as possible, you know, there are a whole range of ways they could make these judgments, but they point out that suppose the scientists are making all these choices in ways that generate sort of most likely scenarios for the future. Well, suppose the policymakers are actually more concerned about worst case scenarios. They really wanna make decisions that take into account the worst things that could happen. Well, even if the scientists aren't you know, trying to do their work in a value-laden way, and they're not trying to kind of manipulate the policymakers, uh, the, the potential worry is if they're making these judgments in particular ways that don't match the values of the decision makers, it may still kind of threaten those decision makers' self-determination to some extent that, you know, the, the values of the scientists doing the work and the values of the decision makers aren't meshing. And so we have this uh, uh, challenge because of these value-laden decisions that go into the science. So this is where I think transparency um, can come in because the ideally, the scientists are transparent about the judgments they're making, well, then that can help preserve the decision maker's self-determination because then they can decide how to handle these judgments in accordance with their own values. Um, they might decide, you know, the science you did is all based on most likely scenarios. We really want to know about worst case scenarios. And so we're just not going to be able to use the science that you provided. This is not what we need. Or they might be able to use the science that's provided to them for some purposes. I and mean, maybe it's gonna work for some kinds of decisions they need to make, but perhaps not for others. Um, and another possibility is sometimes they might be able to either get the original scientists or some other folks to reanalyze the science um, based on different choices or value judgments. And I know when that's feasible, um, there's a really nice paper I recommend that I've got here at the bottom of the slide by Drew Schroeder, where he develops this distinction between what he calls fixed versus user accessible value judgments. So he points out that in some cases, the user accessible cases, um, if you've got access to enough of the data underlying a study and you know how it was done, you can reanalyze the data based on different assumptions. And so you can get results that more match what you're concerned with. In other cases, you just can't really go back and reanalyze in the ways that you want, the way the study was designed um, and so on just isn't going to serve your interests. And so he says those are fixed value judgments. So anyway, in at least some cases, you might be able to reanalyze that work. Um, so to sort of bring this first part of the talk to a close, my main point is when scientists have to make value-laden judgments, it can threaten the ability of decision makers, whether it's these policymakers or you know physicians or judges or other citizens, um, to be. It can threaten their ability to make form decisions for themselves based on their own values, and transparency can, um, to some extent, help solve this problem by returning self-determination to decision makers. Then they're able to understand the kinds of judgments that were made and how it do, they do or don't fit with their priorities and values. And I would just emphasize that I think this role for transparency is important even if you have other visions for how to handle evaluating judgments in science, suppose, you know, Professor Lusk's talk that he was giving um, back last semester, you know, he laid out some really interesting ideas for bringing public deliberation um, to bear on deciding how to address these judgments. And I think it's great to explore that, great to think about how scientists can make these judgments in the most ethically appropriate ways. But I think there are still likely to be people who disagree with the way the judgments were made um, and who might want to make different choices. And I think given the complexity of ethics and politics, it's 
usually uh, better for people to be able to understand when these choices weren't made in ways that fit with their values so that then they can um, potentially, you know, uh, it preserves their self-determination to have that understanding. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you that transparency is worthwhile and important. So now I wanna argue that, and I will say that often when I give talks to the scientific community about these issues, there is a lot of enthusiasm for transparency, suggesting this is a really important way to address these problems. So now I wanna take us a step further and think about how this gets more complicated. Um, so I'd like to suggest that transparency isn't quite as straightforward as it might initially appear, um, so first we need to think through what exactly do we need to be transparent about? So, you know, there's growing emphasis on, you know, trying to be open with, um, you know, the data underlying studies. So you might say, well, should that be the main focus? Um, you know, being open about methods seems pretty important as well. Um, but then, you know, should we actually be highlighting beyond just the data and the methods, actually pinpointing particular judgments that, you know, seem important, that we think it's especially important to, to you know, clarify those? Um, do we also need to be talking about the values that influence the judgments? Or is it enough just to make it clear that these judgments were made? Um, and should we be highlighting the implications of those judgments? Say for the policymakers to really appreciate what's going on, it might be more important for them to just understand the implications. Um, so you know, you know, we got to think more about what we want to be clear about. And then you know, the idea of transparency, you know, it's this metaphor involving clarity, you know, sort of being able to see through. And so then we need to think through, well, information could be clear for some people, but not for others. So, you know, we might be transparent in a way that other scientists can appreciate, but um, it might not still not be so clear for the policymakers or uh, the media or other, you know, concerned members of the community. Um, and so we've got to think through, you know, who are we making this information transparent for? And so, as I started thinking about these issues, I thought, you know, we need to think more carefully about what we mean by transparency. And so um, I uh, explored this in a paper that I published last year, um, where I tried to create a kind of taxonomy of transparency in science. And so um, this figure gives you a, a, an overall sense of what I did in this article. I, I laid out eight different, what I call dimensions of transparency um, that sort of answer four different questions that I have listed on the left. And so, you know, the purpose is one dimension. So I suggest we need to think through, you know, what exactly is our goal when we're trying to be transparent in a particular case? And then that can inform um, who the audience is that we think it's important to reach and make this information transparent for. And then that can have an influence on, you know, what's the content that we think we need to be transparent about. And then we've got these issues about how we present that information. So like, what's the time frame? How early in the course of research do we think we need to actually make this information clear to people? And who are the actors who are then going to provide this information? And what are the mechanisms and venues through which the information is made available? And then on the right, while it may not exactly be part of the transparency itself, I think all these other dimensions have to be informed by our thinking about some of the dangers of transparency, because there can be some challenges and things that can go wrong and, and, and worry associated with it. So um, on the next slide, I kind of blow up a table from the uh, paper, and this looks kind of messy, but basically I'm just pointing out, I have each of the eight dimensions here, and I highlight just how within these dimensions you could vary what you're doing. So if you look down on the left, the third um, sort of section talks about the actors that can actually communicate the information we're trying to be transparent about. And I point out, you know, so we often might think, well, the scientists who perform the research are the ones who should be, you know, being transparent. But it may be in some cases that we actually think other scientists would play an important role in transparency because the original scientists may not appreciate some of the important judgments that they ought to be acknowledging. 
And um, we might think sometimes that scholars working in other fields, I think part of the vision of the rock is that, you know, sometimes philosophers or, you know, people in history or in the social sciences might be able to help the scientific community identify important judgments they're making and help them to communicate them more effectively. So they might play an important role. It could be that journalists or scientific societies or government agencies or NGOs could play a role in this. So I, I try to sort of do this kind of exploring in each of these different dimensions. So I'm not going to sort of delve really deeply into all of that. But my point is that I think that once we think about this taxonomy, it raises a whole bunch of interesting issues that we can think about further. So we can start exploring, you know, what forms of transparency are most important and, you know, which kinds are most feasible for us to achieve. And, you know, who should be taking responsibility back to that issue of the actors, you know, who should actually be trying to engage in this kind of transparency and, you know, how can we handle various dangers that come up? And then I think it's interesting to think about how these dimensions relate to each other. So say you think that particular content is important to communicate to particular audiences, well, then you can think about some of the other dimensions, like, well, you know, who are the actors who are best able to communicate this information? What are the best venues for communicating this information? So um, there's lots that one can do with this. And so in the, the third part of the talk, I want to carve out two specific issues um, for us to discuss and, and think about a little bit more. Um, so uh, the two issues involve thinking a little bit more about um, audiences that we can be reaching and the complexity of that. And then the idea that if we have all these choices involved in how we go about being transparent, um, thinking about the value-laden judgments that actually affect our transparency initiatives. So uh, let me address each of those points. So first, thinking about audiences, um, I think it's natural when we're thinking about transparency to connect this up with the open science movement, because you know this is an effort already with a lot of um, sort of energy within science um, to um, sort of generate a kind of transparency. And so it makes sense to think about you know, how the open science movement is doing with this. And so my worry is that it's not clear that the current initiatives of this movement, although I've got a lot of enthusiasm for it, I'm not sure they're ideally designed for reaching all our desired audiences. And um, so let me say a little bit more about this. Um, first, just to give a sense of what the open science movement involves, um, this is a report from, I think, back in 2018, the National Academy of Sciences put out. And um, this quotation from the report just gives a basic sense of how folks are thinking about open science. They say, it aims to ensure the free availability and usability of scholarly publications. So this is the idea of, you know, getting articles out beyond paywalls so that people can access them. And then uh, the data that result from scholarly research. So like I talked about earlier with open data, the idea of making that available. And then the methodologies, including code or algorithms that were used to generate those data. So also making, you know, code available. So those are some of the big main initiatives that folks are thinking about. But... Um, it can incorporate a wide array of activities. And so I have this figure here. I apologize, it's a little fuzzy, um, but I really like it. I'm taking this from a, a project that was funded by the EU, um, thinking about open science. And these hexagons represent sort of different aspects of the open science movement. So the idea of open access publications is represented in that green hexagon in the middle. And then open data is in the blue hexagon. We can look at some of the other things. So like the red one talks about open peer review, that we could actually make peer review more transparent, either by making the identities of reviewers known, potentially making uh, peer review reports available so um, folks can have a better sense of the strengths and weaknesses of published work. If you look in the purple hexagon, um, some researchers are exploring open lab notebooks where they actually um, make others aware of what they're envisioning doing so they can get feedback on it, potentially improve the design of their studies. Um, the hexagon uh, has citizen science, the idea that we can integrate citizens in with these research efforts. Um, and so 
The point is there are strengths and weaknesses to some of the aspects of these different initiatives, but the point is open science can really take a variety of different forms. And so um, as I was sort of indicating though, um, at the beginning of this discussion of open science, um, my worry is that while there's a lot of good stuff going on, some of the most prominent initiatives aren't as helpful as we might hope for helping policymakers or other community members understand value-laden judgments in science. And so I made this argument in a commentary with David Resnick from a couple years ago, where we ex wanted to explore ways to make open science as, as relevant as possible, not just to the scientific community, but to the broader society. And in that paper, we argued that some of these big initiatives you know, have limitations. So when we think about open access papers, I think it's really great, but you know, if we're really practical, I often can't understand papers in other fields. So it's not clear that everybody can fully appreciate what's going on. And if we're thinking about evaluating judgments, it's not clear that those important judgments are always made very explicit in these papers. And if we think about open data, another key aspect of the movement, I mean, you know, I can't make heads or tails of the data files that people are making available. So that's not gonna do me any good. Um, and so really someone has to examine the data, you know, sort of have enough understanding of the papers to identify the judgments that matter and then communicate this information to people who care. Um, so what I wanna do on the next slide is to think a little bit about some of the, the there are some steps being taken within open science, but um, that I think can be helpful to broader audiences, but they probably haven't gotten as much attention. And so I wanna sort of highlight them for us to think about more. So um, one project that I think is really cool is this um, HACAST program, the NASA Health and Air Quality Applied Sciences Team. So what it does is NASA has all kinds of data that are available to people. And my point on the earlier slide was most of us can't really do much with this data, but they're creating these collaborations where researchers associated with this HackCast team work with local communities or municipalities where say they've got questions about air quality um, and the NASA data can, can help them answer them, um, but you need some mediator um, there, these researchers who can help these communities use the data to answer the questions that they're concerned about. Another project, the server project, um, this is a collaboration between NASA and USAID where this is global, where you can have communities around the world who are concerned about environmental threats like flooding and that sort of thing. And they can go to the server project and there are researchers who will help them use the NASA data to answer their questions. And so this is the kind of, um, you know, creating a kind of openness that's actually usable for people with particular questions or needs. Um, you know, as uh, Wendy Parker and Greg Lusk were talking about in their article, um, I think climate services are another interesting example of this kind of initiative where you've got data, you've got scientific information, but local communities may not be able to understand exactly how that data, how that information um, sort of answers their questions or whether there are particular judgments that were made in the production of the data and of the science that you know may not make it as useful for their purposes. And so climate services ideally can be helpful for this. And that's, um, you know, I refer people to um, Parker and Lusk's article for thinking about that. Um, and then there are community-based participatory research efforts where you can actually have communities get involved in research. And the awesome thing about this is then they can often affect how the research is done so they can influence some of these key judgments from the beginning. Um, and this maybe isn't exactly a climate example, but it's an example I really love. Um, these bucket brigades that are sometimes um, used in fence line communities around industrial facilities where they're concerned about air pollution and they may not trust the kinds of measurements that the companies are making or that government agencies are making. And they've used these sort of buckets you see in the picture there to collect air samples that then they can send to EPA certified labs to get information. And it's a great example of 
just simple different judgments that can be made. Often the government or the company analyses are done on average based over a long period of time emissions, where some of these communities are concerned about very short periods of you know, nasty emissions that may be uh, happening. And so these buckets can enable them to collect data over shorter periods of time um, when there can be spikes in air pollution that they're worried about. Um, just a few other, I won't uh, belabor this, but a few other initiatives that we talk about in our commentary um, that are really interesting. So patient advocacy groups uh, can often clarify information that patients are concerned about. So they can again play this kind of mediating role between the science and particular communities that have questions. I've been doing some research on controversies involving Lyme disease. And um, so I just give an example of a patient group here that's you know, sort of helping to filter information for some of those patients. Um, NGOs can be really valuable. Of course, there are loads of these. I'm just giving an example from the Environmental Working Group that can digest scientific information, highlight strengths and weaknesses, um, you know, pinpoint important judgments that might matter to particular communities. Um, and then I think journalism can play an interesting role here. Um, and this is something that I explored in a paper a couple of years ago, um, thinking about how um, you can just the title, I was thinking about the open science movement and thinking about how science journalists can highlight important judgments for people. And in some ways their training is really good for this because when they have the opportunity to really do thoughtful reporting, they can talk to multiple scientists, get a sense of you know, uh, the different judgments to be made. Um, potentially, you know, they're often trained to explore conflicts of interest in research and so on. And so I think they have an interesting role to play perhaps as part of this. So um, the last point I'll make about this issue of audiences, though, is note how much of what I'm talking about involves systems of different people and organizations. So it's not just the scientists saying, OK, I'm going to be transparent about the judgments that I made. Um, the thought is that meaningful transparency actually requires thinking about the right partnerships between scientists and others who can then serve as kind of a bridge to different uh, you know, individuals and communities that have questions or concerns of particular sorts. Okay, so that's my point about you know, how we can be thinking a little bit more about transparency that's meaningful to particular audiences. So now I wanna to turn to the second issue that I think is interesting to explore. And that's thinking about how our F transparency could recapitulate, if you will, the values that are playing a role in science itself. And so, you know, I pointed out in that article about the taxonomy of transparency, that transparency itself requires judgments about who are you trying to reach, what venues are you using for communicating the information, who are the actors communicating it, you know, what dangers are important to avoid, and so on. Um, and so the way I've been thinking about this is that these judgments involved in transparency, we could think of as second order judgments about how to communicate the first order judgments about how to do science. So we've got those basic judgments about, you know, what data do we collect? How do we model it? And so on. And then we've got these judgments about, you know, how do we communicate about those first order judgments? And so um, the worry one might raise though, is that then, you know, I was all excited in the first part of the talk, hey, transparency can help us address these worries about value-laden judgments in science. We might say, well, this is a problem if you've got value-laden judgments and how to be transparent, those values at the first order level could reappear at the second order level and maybe sort of, um, you know, cause your transparency to not be as effective as um, one might hope. So I just wanna explore this a little bit. This is something I'm continuing to think about. It would be fun to, to get um, feedback from all of you in the Q&A. So if we were to, just to make this concrete, say we think back to our municipality um, that's worried about those lake water levels and we've got those scientists who are making, you know, do they um, sort of, you know, make various judgments in ways that generate most likely scenarios or worst case scenarios? We'll say those scientists acknowledged that they really weren't considering worst case scenarios. But if they communicated that in a really muted or inconspicuous way, say they have like a footnote in their report 
that acknowledges that these were most likely scenarios, but they don't really explicitly talk about this with the uh, municipal policymakers. Well, that information just go under the radar and then your transparency really didn't do you much good at addressing what you were hoping to. Um, and so I'd like to give an example um, related to climate change. And my guess is that this crowd is going to know this example better than I do. So um, feel free to correct me, you know, suggest, you know, whether you think this actually works. But I took this from a paper I really like, um, The Ethics of Scientific Communication Under Uncertainty. And um, they discuss the situation um, that, you know, in this assessment, um, they felt like they could predict the thermal expansion of water and the melting of mountain glaciers, these two factors that contributed to sea level rise, but that the third factor that contributes to sea level rise, ice sheet disintegration from Greenland or the Antarctic ice sheet, that they didn't have really solid ways of predicting that. So they had to figure out what to do. And so my understanding is that the IPCC decided to provide a prediction of sea level rise that left out the contribution of ice sheet disintegration. They considered the two factors that they felt like they could model well, but then left out the third. And so as this article discusses, um, there was a kind of transparency about this judgment in the IPCC report. They included a note in the table caption and they had some text um, that discussed ice sheet disintegration. But at least uh, as far as Keyhane and Lane and Oppenheimer are concerned, um, the approach was controversial because of the potential to cause confusion that policymakers might not fully appreciate these uh, the significance of the choices made. And they might try to make decisions based on these two factors that were included and not really appreciate how important the third factor might be. Um, so if we put this in terms of my framework of thinking about first order judgments and then second order judgments, um, the first order judgment in this report was, you know, how much and what kind of evidence do we need in order to draw conclusions about the ice sheet disintegration. Should we actually include information about that in the IPCC report? And so I think the judgment not to try to draw conclusions, at least as I see it, prioritized scientific rigor or accuracy. The thought is we're not going to include information in this report that would have to depend on like subjective expert judgment. You know, we need sort of solid published work on it. Um, on the other hand, if you had really wanted to prioritize comprehensiveness or practical usability, maybe you would have tried to actually provide an estimate, even if it might not have been as solid. So, you know, again, there are different considerations on either side, um, but this is the judgment that was made. So then the second order judgment is, well, how do you be transparent about this choice that went into the report? How should that decision not to draw conclusions about the ice sheet disintegration be made transparent? And so arguably, I think the judgment not to feature that information more prominently, um, again, kind of downplays the value of comprehensiveness and practical usability, I think. I think if you were really concerned about the practical usability for policymakers, you might have really flagged this in some very explicit, clear way um, to be careful, maybe not to, you know, to, to be aware that you've got a huge fluctuation here, potentially depending on ice sheet disintegration. So, um, like I said, I haven't really sort of I, I don't feel like I have ideal answers to how to address this, but let me just say a little bit about this before we wrap up. Um, how should we respond to this fact that you can have these important values at the second order level about how transparency occurs? Um, I think awareness is actually a first step, realizing that, that we really need to think carefully about how we're being transparent about these judgments, that it's not some simple matter if we just lay out the information and it doesn't really matter how we do it. Um, and so I think that's part of the issue. I also think that we need to be incorporating an array of perspectives when handling both the first order judgments in how we do science and these second order judgments about how to be transparent. And my point here is you might think that transparency is something that individual scientists can handle. The thought is, you know, they can do their work, they're going to be, you know, making, you know, particular value-laden judgments, but as long as they're transparent about them, we'll be okay, then others can recognize what was done. And I think we need a more sort of 
social perspective here. Uh, we need to realize that individuals, the way they're transparent is going to be informed in some ways by the same values that inform their lower level judgments in science. And so maybe we need more people involved, not just individuals, not just individual labs. And so what I'm saying here, I think has much in common with the work of Helen Longino, an influential philosopher of science, who says when we're managing values, we need critical interaction, we need venues for criticism and appropriate uptake of criticism. So it's shifting our perspective of objectivity from an individual level to a more social level. And you might think that transparency could enable us to stay at an individual level and be okay. And I'm suggesting, no, it's not gonna do the trick because these values can reappear at that level of transparency. You, maybe we really do need that social uh, perspective. And so I would note, you know, when I was talking about audiences, I said, we need to think in a systemic or structural way. How are we gonna reach different audiences? And so while I don't have like a brilliant analysis of the second part, I think once again, we need to think in a systemic or structural way about how to handle this. Um, so that brings me to, to the end. Um, I've tried to suggest that transparency is really important for addressing value-laden judgments in policy-relevant science. I've said, I've tried to inspire um, us all to think a little bit more about the nature of transparency to suggest that this merits more uh, consideration. And then I've sort of laid out these two issues that maybe we can think about a little bit more. First, thinking about how we can direct transparency to an array of audiences and how we can handle the fact that transparency efforts themselves are value-laden. And I've tried to say, we need to think in a kind of structural systemic way about both of these issues. So I'd love to get your, your feedback and thoughts. And would it be helpful for me to stop sharing my screen perhaps? Uh, what do you think is the best format here, Nancy? Either way, you can leave it. You know, well, this is fine. Uh, Maybe I'll stop. And then if folks have questions where it'd be useful to go back to a particular slide, I'll put it back up. So remember, feel free to either raise your hand or um, use the chat function. Either one is fine for asking questions. And while you're doing that, I'll just go ahead and use my position to ask the first question. Kevin, I was thinking as you were talking that there's another dimension of transparency that has to be brought to bear. And that's, you know, you talked about how it would be helpful for transparency in how the science is done so that decision makers could then decide how to use the knowledge. But there's also the values of the decision makers that need to be transparent as well. And in fact, I would mm -hmm. argue that not only do the decision makers need a sense of what their values are and why those are their values, but also they need to be able to communicate those to the scientists because otherwise it's hard to know. It's, you know, you're talking also about um, when you talked about open science, the ability to understand how they can use the knowledge um, so, for example, with the work that we do, we start with one of the ways we start is by working with decision makers and community members to determine what it is that they value. And then to begin to start to address some of the issues by modeling or providing science that helps them answer those questions. For example, there may be some things they value that the science can't address and helping them understand that would be very helpful. But um, the way you presented it, it sounded more like the scientists just go ahead and do the science that they're interested in. And then it's either more or less useful to the community depending on how transparent one can be about it. So I just wanted you to think about that other dimension and to think about sort of the interaction between um, decision makers and scientists. 
So I love that point. I completely agree with you. I think that's definitely something that would be valuable for me to add into the discussion. I think that the one point in the talk where I probably got the closest to your point was in discussing the community uh, based participatory research, where, you know, I'm a, definitely a major fan of having that sort of influence of the communities on the doing of the science. And like just one interesting example um, related to the, the bucket brigade that I talked about. Um, you know, there was a, a published study um, done on um, air pollution effects of fracking operations where um, you actually had, you know, it was very much driven by these communities, um, you know, collecting the data in the areas they were concerned about, you know, addressing questions that they were concerned about. And so um, anyway, I think that you can have a whole range of degrees of community influence. Um, and um, I, I completely agree with you that the more you can sort of have their input, um, the better. But I, I, I hadn't really thought so much about your point about thinking about transparency about their values. So I, I really like that. So we actually have three people in the queue right now, Rob Nicholas, and then Michelle, and then Casey. So Rob, um, I need to, I need to figure out how to allow you to be, how to speak. Uh oh. Okay, I think I can speak now. Oh, yeah, you can speak. Okay, great. Um, uh, thanks, Kevin. That was a really fantastic talk. Uh, I really, uh, really enjoyed your sort of broader vision, uh, a comprehensive vision for transparency in, um, in uh, use-driven science. Um, but doing open science is a lot of work. <laughs> it's um, already sort of in the framework that we have. You know, uh, it, it's, it's actually a lot of additional work to make your code, you know, discernible even by other people in your field, to make your data uh, usable by other people in your field. And, and so on. And, you know, I, I, we get requests for some data, you know, some data set that we worked on five years ago and trying to be able to, there's a support burden really associated with that as well. So um, I guess my question is a very practical one, which is, um, I like the vision. What's, what's the practical way of making this all happen, given that, um, you know, even from the funding agencies now, there's not really enough support to make uh, to meet the demands of open science that they have now. Yeah, such a good point. And if it's okay, I'm going ahead and sharing my screen because um, let me see if I can actually uh, make this a little bigger for all of you. Um, so if you look down in the lower right, I you know discuss some of the dangers that we need to consider associated with transparency. And I'm totally sympathetic to what you're, what you're saying. I suggest that it can, you know, I don't know, wasting scarce resources may be an overly harsh way of putting it. But right. the idea is, you know, scientists have a limited amount of time. They've got a limited amount of money. Um, and uh, and I totally agree that this can be a lot of work. And um, so, so it's a perfect point to make. And I think what I would uh, say is that maybe some of the points I was making about um, the different audiences we're trying to reach, it could seem totally overwhelming if I'm saying, hey, you scientists need to figure out how to be transparent to all, all these different audiences. I mean, it's already enough of a mess for them just to make their data available in a usable way. Um, right. But I, I'm, I'm wondering, I'd be curious what you think about the idea that um, if we are um, incorporating some of this more systemic perspective, like I think it's really interesting to think about like the role at land grant universities of the extension programs that ideally, you know, you can have these sort of mediators who are already there that to potentially, you know, take information back and forth between the researchers and communities um, and some of these other organizations, whether it be NGOs or others. So you still, I acknowledge, you still have the work of making your data available. Um, but I wonder if in most cases that's maybe um, worth the investment and maybe we need funding agencies to provide the resources to do that. But then some of these other organizations can do some of the messy work that I'm talking about. I don't know if that helps. I, I think that, I mean, I think that's a, that's a great idea. Um, I mean, we, we are really good in the academy at preparing people to be uh, tenure line professors, and we're not so good at preparing them for other roles when they come out of PhD programs, but we need people in those, in those roles to do exactly that. Um, there, is, there is sort of the, 
the interaction cost of working with with those 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 folks that are doing the translation too, and that that's not that's not zero, but but I think okay. you're right. So gr great points. Really good to talk about more. So unfortunately, Michelle had to leave. So Casey, I think you can unmute yourself. Yes. Hi. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Like Rob, I really appreciated how you were um, thinking in a broad and systematic way beyond just the you know actions of individual scientists. Um, and that sort of got me thinking about other aspects of the very broad and systematic uh, picture about transparency. And, and it got me thinking about um, sort of academic and disciplinary reward structures. Um, for example, um, arguably a good way to get into science and nature is to oversell your conclusions, which is kind of the opposite of transparency. Um, do you, how do you see these um, reward structures fitting in? Yeah, that's a, another great point. And I think it's, it's very appropriate that one might get the feel from my talk, like everybody just has the best intentions. And of course, you know, once you encourage the scientists to be transparent, everything's going to be great. And so I really like your point that there are these pressures pushing in other ways. Um, for those who are interested in this, I actually um, highly recommend a paper that came out recently by Kristen Intiman um, in the same issue of the Canadian Journal of Philosophy that my um, article on transparency is in. This came out of a workshop that was organized. And so um, Kristen talks about the phenomenon of hype in that paper. And so it's really interesting um, discussing, you know, she highlights the fact that some people might think that hype is mainly a matter of, you know, these like journalists who get all riled up. And she points out that you have, just as you're saying, Casey, these systematic pressures for everybody involved, the scientists, the, the universities putting out the press releases, um, and so on, these kinds of incentives to um, hype things in particular ways. And, and she does a really nice analysis of actually the value of nature of even trying to define what hype is, that it's, it's more complicated than it initially appears. But anyway, so with that just initial point um, that uh, I think, you know, uh, Kristen would have a lot of interesting things to say about that. Um, I think that, um, so a couple things, maybe this partly is another reason why it would be a mistake to just depend on the scientists themselves. And maybe what you're suggesting, Casey, is actually another interesting example of the value-laden nature of transparency. You know, you might, uh, so, so the worry might be, well, the scientists just won't be transparent as all, at all. But it could also be that the way they're, they may acknowledge some of these issues, but the way they do so it may be kind of dismissive. It may be framed in particular ways that are informed by these broader goals. And, and so again, I wonder if my, my inclination would be to move in the direction of th thinking about the broader system of different actors involved here and actually sort of flipping things where we might've thought that the journalists were gonna be the problem. In some cases, I think they could actually be helpful in terms of, you know, you can have the excitement from a journalistic perspective of, you know, highlighting these exciting, you know, sort of findings. But sometimes an interesting story can actually be um, sort of showing the ways in which the scientists might be overhyping or bringing in different scientists' perspectives on it. And so um, anyway, journalism is just a whole huge issue of its own that I'm just kind of dabbling in and there's a lot of complexity. Um, so I don't want to sort of make it seem overly simple, but I do wonder if some of these other organizations, I, uh, just um, again, we can think of the role of the NGOs that sometimes people might worry that they are sort of in a simplistic way, kind of spinning the science in particular ways. But I think they can also play a valuable role in highlighting the fact that, hey, these scientists aren't taking certain issues into consideration or they're over exaggerating the potential benefits of such and such. And so anyway, I I think it would be interesting to consider how these different um, groups could help in sort of counterbalancing some of these concerns. Thanks, Kevin. And I'll look at the, the intimate paper too. Yeah, yeah. So we have time for one more question. If anyone would like to raise their hand or enter it into chat. <laughs> 
Too bad Michelle had to run off. It would have I been know. perfect. <laughs> well, <laughs> given that we don't have any more questions, let me um, see if I can, yes, find the right slide to share. And um, not only thank Kevin for um, giving us a lot to think about, but also um, urging people to come back again to our series. Um, we have Matt Adler um, on February 18th and then Wendy Parker as, as Kevin was mentioning on the 25th and uh, Elizabeth Lloyd on the first and Naomi Oreskes on the 22nd. So we can guarantee you a very interesting series of discussions about the role of values in science. So thank you, Kevin. It was wonderful to talk with you and learn, learn with you. And, um, Thank you again. Bye. Yeah, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much.